and come in here then. Oh, that'd be silly. Oh, I like to try and stand my pants. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me increase my volume. Can you come either closer to the computer because your volume is very, very low? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. That's good. Good. Liv, that is great, man. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go straight into the interview. Then we can have a little chat and things like that. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and right now you are running Lucy's Trust, aren't you? It's a charity. Yes, I am for my yeah. Are you doing anything else? Um, currently, I'm trying to write a book as well. I saw. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Okay, so let, let me just start. Okay, today I'm very, very excited to have my extremely, extremely esteemed colleague back in uh, vet days in Royal Vet College when we were studying over there, not exactly getting drunk, but close to, <laughs> and uh, partying the night away and also studying daytime. We've got Dr. Olivia Kennedy, who is now working in Ireland. She has been working as a general practitioner before, but now she's actually... Uh, in the, well, she's uh, founded her own charity, which we'll discuss a little bit more about it, called Lucy's Trust. And she's also in the middle of writing a book. Olivia, it is so good to see you. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. It's so good to see you, Len. It's been way too long. <laughs> good. And uh, I just wanted to ask you a few questions, really, about your journey and about being a vet. And uh, we'll start off with the most cliche one. Why did you become a vet? Oh, why? I think much the same as most of us, it's like a calling. As soon as you understood or realized what a vet was, you just sort of went, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And for me, it was the family cat. I, I grew up on a farm, so farm cats weren't really taken to vets or anything like that by my dad. But the family cat had a prolapse. And I remember I was about eight or nine. She was two years older than me, so she'd gone a long time without getting spayed. And I remember being allowed to go to the vets to collect her. The first one of our cats that I was aware of that went to the vet. And it was Lynn Hill, actually, who was um, wow. the head of QMH when we were there. Yeah. She, was, she was the vet. And I just remember peering over the table and seeing how much my little cat loved her. And she'd saved my little cat's life. And I just I fell in love with her at that minute. And I just wanted to be her. This is, I'm like, this is what I want to do forever. I want to see if people's little cats. That so is amazing. Amazing. That that's is amazing. That is amazing. Lynn Hill. Yeah, yeah. So was she working in Ireland? Yeah, she had a practice in Crumlin. Just up the road. Wow. Yeah, so just for the record, so Lynn Hill, uh, Lynn, Lynn Hill is uh, one of the sort of the almost clinical director of QMH when we were there. And she has now gone to do much, much bigger things uh, and to help the vet profession. That is a fascinating story. So when you were in vet college in RVC like myself, I remember you being extremely confident. You sort of knew exactly what you were doing. And <laughs> what sort of challenges did you find that you faced during college? Um, I actually found college really difficult. I was an incredibly good actor. <laughs> Um, I think for me, being away from home was a big one. I was very homesick, especially in the first couple of years when we were down in Camden in central London or North London. Mm. Um, coming from the country and then suddenly being in a city environment was really hard. And mm. I remember, you know, I remember we used to go out on the animal handling. We would go out to Bolton's mm. farm mm. once a third, well, every Thursday or something like that. Mm. And I remember on the bus back nearly every week, I was almost in tears just watching the green disappear into concrete. I just thought, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. So I, I moved out to Hawks Head in first year. And that helped, being surrounded by green fields and being able to take a walk on the country lane helped. Um, studying too, I was never academic. I was never particularly academic. And I was one of the ones when I was trying to study in my room, I would fall asleep on my textbook and wake up like two hours later and start to the page, you know, like kind of a way. I, I struggled with the study a lot. I tried my best, but I did struggle with that. And I liked the more practical things. The more practical things we did, the more I felt part of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So would you, if you could give it a percentage, how much percent would you say there was a lot of academic studying stuff compared to the practical stuff you get in vet college? Um, I probably should have been doing more academic study than I was. <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, I mean, even even the practical stuff, you have to study about it before you get to do it. So I would say 70, 30, you know, until you get into the um, fourth year and go on rotation. And then so, 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 so 70% theory-based, lecture-based yeah. sort of thing, and 30% practical-based. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, so it sounded as though you had quite a challenging time because I can appreciate coming from Singapore, you know, I know all about being homesick and uh, I, sus I, I suspect... Not big... so well. <laughs> exactly. I suspect uh, what, what one slight advantage I had was Singapore is a city. So it's going from a city to a city. So uh, in fact, when I went up to Hawks Head, I, it nearly drove me crazy because it was too quiet. <laughs> I did. I did enjoy. I did enjoy the weekends coming back into uh, into into London to play basketball games. But that that's a challenge. That's a challenge. So that is a, one of those challenges. And uh, like yourself, you know, I wasn't very academic, as many people may have known. You know, I failed in my first, third, and fifth year. And <laughs> so why, Jesus? It doesn't. I mean, that's one thing I always say is that. You know, just because you can fly through exams doesn't make you a better vet <laughs> in any way, shape or form. An exam is not the same as being a vet. <laughs> I totally agree. I, can, I, I know exactly what I mean by that. And let's talk about when you finish, uh, what, what do you do after when you graduated? I came home to work in the practice where I saw a lot of my um, large animal practice. Mm. Um, he offered me the job as soon as I rang to tell him that I qualified. And you know, the thought of not having to write a CV, I was just like, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. <laughs> Whips. So I was there for about a year, a year and four months or something. And um, I left there under a cloud um, and went six miles up the road to join another, another practice. <laughs> and I worked there for six years. And then when I eventually left there, um, I started Lucy's Trust. Yeah, before we go to Lucy's Trust, because I really want to get into that, um, what challenges did you face, you know, uh, when you were working? What, what, what was okay? What was working? What wasn't working for you? Um, certainly my first job, mm. because I, had, I knew, knew my boss so well and he knew me so well, it was more of a challenge in that I got pushed to do things that he knew how to push me just outside of my comfort zone. Mm because he knew I was capable of it, which was great. I mean, you could call it a baptism of fire, like it set me up for my career. I was spaying dogs, you know, inside 30 minutes within a month of being qualified, because we didn't have any gas, Lennon. We were doing it on bio, so you had 20 to 30 minutes, and that was 20, 25 minutes tops. <laughs> yeah. So it really was a baptism of fire, but the flip side of that was there were times when I really felt like I was drowning. I really felt like I was drowning, that this was, you know, I wasn't ready for this. I wasn't good enough at this. And, you know, in, in the first month, he took off to Dublin for the weekend and left me so charged. So you wow. can imagine what sort of weight that is on a new grad's head. It was utterly terrifying. Um, it stood me in good stead. Like, when, by the time I left, you know, I, I probably had the capabilities surgically anyway of somebody who was four years qualified. But at the time, it was very, very hard. I lost a lot of weight. Um, I just literally worked like a dog for a year. I was only one or two for a month or two. And just, it was, it was really, really hard. So I think I kind of almost burnt myself out there. It's it um, that, um, that is challenging. Yeah. There was, yeah. I I'm not going to say there wasn't a lot of support because there was to an extent, but probably not delivered in the right way. Mm. Um, when I joined my second practice, it was, it was like, I mean, we're talking spit and sawdust practices here, Len, and like neither practice had a qualified nurse. I haven't, I didn't get to work with a qualified, I don't know if I've ever worked with a qualified nurse. So, you know, you cleaned up after yourself, you put the kits into the autoclave because you had a receptionist who would work off the feet and that was it. So, you know, you did the prepping of the dog, you did everything from start to finish. Mm. And that was a very busy clinic. Um, we would have seen in the clinic in the morning, you could see 20 to 30 consultations and you could have a list of 10 operations to do and calls to get out on and TB tests. And it was just go, 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 go. Um, 
but I didn't find it as stressful as my first job because I'm not going to say I had more support from my boss. I didn't, but I had a better team of other vets around me to give mm. me that support, you know, and we would mm. help each other. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was tough. Looking back, it was tough at the time. You just tore on and did it. Mm. So. It is a, it is a challenge, isn't it? To try, because I know you're an extremely competent vet and that probably is due to the baptism by fire. Yeah. So you want to sort of balance between pushing yourself so you're out of a comfort zone and you learn and you grow compared to help actually. <laughs> this Enjoy. is way too much. <laughs> and that is the balance that, you know, exactly. It really, I, I, I think people, they do not really understand the difference between, um, and, and it's also characters as well, you know. Yeah. Uh, what are you like individually? to be able to balance both. Some people, they thrive being in a fire and some people, they thrive being totally handheld until they're much more confident at the later stage. Yeah. So that, that is uh, quite challenging. Um, and after that, you set up Lucy's Trust. So I've been sort of following yourself, you know, it's almost, what, almost 10 years now, Lucy's Trust? Yeah, 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. So tell us a little bit more about Lucy's Trust, please. Um, well, Lucy's Trust now, these days, we deal in long-term dogs, behavioural cases mainly. Um, we've started taking um, red dogs, as it were, from other charities who have bitten, um, giving them long-term care. We also provide um, behavioural support and actual feed-on-the-ground behaviourists to go out in people's homes and help them work with their dogs if they're struggling. Positive, all positive, reward-based trainers and behaviourists. Anybody who is not, and there's a lot of them who aren't in this country, unfortunately, is not on my list. <laughs> I have a separate list for them, which is called the SH1T list. Um, but, um, yeah, so that's what we do now. But we started initially because of that second job um, where I was having to put to sleep um, dogs for the local pound. We had the contract for a pound euthanasia. Right. And, which I was aware of when I took the job, but I was not aware of how many dogs there would be. And I mean, it was six, six miles down the road from my original job. And in my original job, I think in that whole year and a bit, I saw one dog that was not reclaimed. You know, they came in as a stray, went to the point and wasn't reclaimed. And I actually went and got her out and got her home the next day. She's a wee Pomeranian, and really wee thing, Bobby. Sweet. So I thought, well, how bad can it be? Like, if there's one dog a year, I can find it at home. It'll be all right. Little did I know, it wasn't one dog a year. At that time, you could have seen 10 dogs a week. It would be amazing, yeah. Um, in the beginning, I used to avoid it like the plague. Like, you'd see the dog warden's van coming in. It'd be like, right, okay, I'm off to that TB test. Bye, everybody, not doing this. And as time wore on, watching other vets doing it, and everybody was very cold and clinical about it and I just thought no I should be doing this because the last thing they need is you know people talking about the weather and trying to block it out they need somebody to hold them and you know love them for a minute if that's all they get so I started to do it and um, talk about taking the heart out of you Lennon it just it ripped the soul out of me and the, um, the dog warden I hated him <laughs> I hated to see him. I hated the sound of his van. Mm -hmm. He used to come in and whistle. And you know, you'd hear the back door going and him starting to whistle. And you'd be like, oh no, not again. Mm -hmm. Until I got talking to him one day. He was just being really brisk about a dog pulling him out of the van and all the rest of it. And I'm like, oh, hold up, Jack. You don't do that around me. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm sorry. And we got talking and I realized that there was this man that everybody you know, sort of, you know, didn't care, really didn't care. And we chatted for about half an hour. And it wasn't that he didn't care, it was that he had to put up, in order to do his job, he had to put up such a thick wall between him and what he was doing, mm -hmm. that he had almost forgotten what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He had to, because there was mm -hmm. no way he could walk into a pound being told the council, you know, we need 10 kennels this morning, mm -hmm. and you've got to pick each dog. You know, that's, that's it was a harder job even than what I was doing. Mm. So actually, we became good friends. Um, you know, he helped me a lot in the latter years. Um, but that's, 
that's where it started from. It was like it got to the stage where I just couldn't couldn't do it anymore. Couldn't do it anymore. So um, so fundamentally you were almost inspired to start this trust because you were the vet or you and your group of vets were contracted to be putting down almost pretty much healthy animals that abandoned uh, abandoned dogs that nobody wanted uh, just because there's just too many and you just couldn't see that and you found that actually you know if you can rehome it it would be better than just putting it down but more importantly it sounds as though you know there's i've heard this saying before as for vets First of all, we are the only random profession apart from some bits in Switzerland that actually have euthanasia as part of our job description and uh, nobody else does it. And uh, every single time we put an animal down, something inside of us dies as well. So it does accumulate and the way to get around it is to, without sounding random, build a wall. Or either that or not do it because if you don't build a wall and you're involved emotionally every single euthanasia you do, it is uh, very challenging to try to keep the balance between what is normal, what is not, and if that's considered normal, then you know it, it can be quite a uh, uh, sort of it, it, it kills your soul, you know something that. So I can appreciate your story about the dog warden who appears to be uncaring because he has to be to do that particular job. And like the group of vets that you saw that, you know, they also want to do their jobs, which really, really comes back to the whole idea of why we become vets in the first place is to help animals. It almost goes against it such that uh, we are not helping animals because helping animals is not really it. putting healthy animals to sleep on a regular basis with no good reason apart from a surplus, yeah. so, so to speak. Well, I remember the, the day that broke me. And I'm going to try and recount the story without crying, but it's not easy. Um, there was three dogs in that day, it might have been four. And my uh, colleague was there with me. She was holding them um, as I was putting them to sleep. And the first dog was a little um, German Shepherd cross, lovely little thing. I put her to sleep and I was already in tears. And I moved to the second dog. Forgive me, because I can still see his little face. And he was like a, a staffy cross of the collie or something. Like he was black and white, but he didn't quite have the chops of the staffy and he wasn't quite as skinny face as a collie. And he was the loveliest little thing. I named him Teddy after the fact, but he, uh, because I was crying, all he wanted to do was comfort me. I put him to sleep and that was it. I was raging against the world. I was just, I was in bed and we still had one more job to do. And that was a little lurcher, no more than a puppy at the end of the kennel. And a, a vet student, who was a student at the time, she just walked through the door and she'd seen me in a heap, you know, just gurning my eyes out. And she's like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I'm like, effing and blinding about people dumping their dogs and this is what we have to do and da, da, da. and she said and, and I said and I still have to kill that and it's a puppy and she just went I'll take her <laughs> I'll take her and she she just I'm like where are you gonna put her she goes I don't know my granny will have her it's fine <laughs> it's fine wow. and she did she took that little dog she called her Bay, and um, I think it was her grandmother she went, oh what a story it, it was after that day I just thought, no, I have to find a solution to this. I have to no. change this. Yeah, it, 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 it took a while, but we did. We did. Good. Uh, good on you and good on everybody else you have helped and affected because of what you're doing. That's so important. You know, many people, they see that, oh, you're a vet. Uh, is it all just lovey-dovey playing with puppies and all this sort of things? Or, 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 you know, they get the whole, um, oh, I've always wanted to be a vet. It must be such a glamorous job. You <laughs> must love your job very, very much. I mean, I do, but <laughs> exactly. It's not for the reasons that I think. And I think the reality is that I don't think many people actually know what we do uh, or potentially what we have to do um, in the name of being a vet, really. Yeah. And uh, that, that is challenging. But and I don't think you appreciate it even as a student either. No, no. You know, no, no. Even, even though we're shadowing vets and we're working with them all the time, you're talking about that wall. It's, it's like there's a wall between you and them. There's a, like a professional wall almost where 
you kind of bow down to all their decisions and go, oh, well, they're the vet, so they must be right. And, you know, everybody says, ah, oh, well, and you go, ah, oh, well, too. Sometimes it's a bit more upsetting than it is. Yes. But it's when it falls on your shoulders yes. to make that decision, it yes. completely changes your outlook of the whole thing. Like it's, you know, it's one thing standing in and watching, you know, somebody trying to resuscitate a dog. It's quite another thing when you're the one doing it and you're invested yes. in it. Yes. You know? So it's, it's something I think is, as a student, I wasn't necessarily completely no. aware of. Either. No, no. And, and certainly I don't think we were, we were exposed to that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't fault our VC at all because every college has its own challenges to teach anybody. And if you were to make me principal, I'll probably struggle trying to draw a syllabus to cram the entire vet syllabus into five years as well. But I can still remember, you know, going to QMH and uh, watching the specialists uh, doing their surgeries and all of us, a group in a corner, <laughs> watching them from, from a distance. You're like, I don't think we're really learning anything over there. <laughs> And that was a waste of time, let's face it. That really was. Yeah. Yeah. But like scanning. Do you remember the scanning? Like I've yes. always been rubbish at scanning because I never had the opportunity in any no. way. No. Do you remember like 30 of us crammed into a stable? I can't remember it was a cross bed for this somebody. I can't remember. But like scanning the horse's tendon and you couldn't even see the screen of the thing. And it was like Exactly. All exactly. Right, then. Scan and practice done. <laughs> that is hilarious. And, and also, even, even when the detailed ones, like you have Pete Mantis over there scanning, tell you where everything is, they're like, okay, okay, it makes it look so easy. Yeah. But when you go to the scanner, goes over there, it's all 50 shades of grey and nothing else. <laughs> so, no, I can appreciate that. In, in my second practice, we had one that literally was like a magic eye picture. Like, you had to go. You had to get back and go, oh, what am I saying? What am I saying? It was so fuzzy. It was a magic eye picture. And it was only good for um, pregnancy diagnosis. That was the only thing you could reliably do. The boss used to like go like, oh, yes, I can do this, that, and the other. And you'd be like, no, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you did get a better one many years later. And it was great. And you'd be like, oh, my God, that's what a liver looks like on the scanner. Awesome. Well done. You were talking about walls, and that's also one thing which uh, I, I totally understand what you mean. There, there are so many walls, and part of what I'm doing, or my organization is doing, is trying to break down those walls, and the walls which we are really interested in is the walls between the vet profession and the general public. There's this huge wall over there that they do not actually know what we do, and we have got so clinical, we have sometimes forgotten the human contact with the animals, and uh, that is what I'm quite sort of, uh, my, my, you know, my team and I are quite passionate about to bring the humanity back into vet medicine. And that's why we do what we do. Um, no, that is, yeah, lighting Lucy's trust, you know, that is an amazing thing. May I just ask, why Lucy? Do you not remember my Lucy dog, Lennon? I may have to slap you. I actually remember that. <laughs> I actually remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, now you mentioned I actually remember that. I said, because, uh, the, because there was also the Lucy's Law. So, yeah, no, no exactly. Trust, exactly. So I was like, not mine. Because <laughs> your trust came before Lucy's Law, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. Thanks for clearing that up. Um, yeah, so after that, doing this, um, and what about, let's talk a little bit about that profession itself. So, Back to what I was saying, you know, the public, they, they, they think we are a certain thing. Uh, being vets is, you know, glamorous, cool. It must be so cool. And many people say that, you know, uh, they, they are not able to do it for various reasons. Um, and the reality is that, you know, looking, being a vet for more, 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 more than sort of 15 years and looking at the current statistics, and I realize the statistics are not that current. It's been ongoing. A few statistics that for me is a little bit concerning is the high depression rate of what vets have and the high dropout rates as well, whereby, you know, Spieth's um, mentioned about 38% of vets drop out in the first sort of five years of their career. And this is just two years ago. And uh, the, also the low, uh, sorry, the high suicide rate, how vets are twice more likely to end their lives compared to medical profession and four times more likely compared to the general public. And when I looked in a little bit more, I realized that this is actually not new stats. These are very old stats and they're just ongoing. And that's my concern. What's your take on that? Why do you think that is then? Um, 
honestly, I don't think it's that we have access to the drugs. I've read a few things that said, you know, it's because we have access to these drugs and we're using them all the time because we already know what's right and what's wrong. I think we, we, might find, we may find it easier to commit a successful suicide because we have access to those drugs, but I don't think it's the drugs themselves and even the euthanasia of animals that make us make that decision. I mean, I have read a few things that said, you know, it's because it blur, euthanasia blurs the line for us. And we say, well, you know, if it was a dog in that much pain, I would put him out of his misery. So yeah. why do I have to live in this kind of pain? I don't think it's so much that, because human beings, all of us, vets included, value our lives to a degree. To actually get as far as taking your own life, there is an awful, awful lot that has to come down on your shoulders before that happens. And I'm speaking as someone who has suffered from depression and has contemplated suicide to the point where I had my plan drawn up to do it. I think as a vet, there are no cries for help as vets. So where you, it's gonna sound really horrible, but a lot of times, you know, we were talking about the general population, you're seeing pills overdoses, you're having people getting their stomachs pumped. And, you know, to me, a lot of that is a cry for help. They didn't genuinely necessarily want to do it. They were in a very dark place. They might have thought they really wanted to do it. But there, there was a small chink of light there, to me. Mm -hmm. um, for us vets, we wouldn't even attempt it if we weren't 100% certain that that's it. Because we know as soon as we put that needle in our vein, 100% that is it. Mm. So to me, I think suicide amongst our profession is almost, um, is almost worse than what you're saying with the, you know, with the general population four times more likely. Because some of those suicides registered from the general population will be more or less accidental, you know? Um, we have the ways and means to do it at any time. But we also, I think, now I can only speak from personal experience. You can get to some very, 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 very dark places, but you know that as soon as you do this, that's it. It's probably, a, it's a difficult thing to try and get your head around and put into words, but just to say that I don't think access to drugs is what I, I, I will second, yeah, I'll second you on that. Um, I'll just like to ask a little bit more of, I understand about not access to drugs, I understand getting to the very dark place. Why do you think they get to the dark place? Why do you think there's even a dark place to begin with? Where did they get it from? Is there something about profession is that being a vet itself? Or do you think it's something external being a vet and it just happens to be vet? that have been going through uh, well, I, think, I, mean, I, mean, I think depression is on the rise worldwide in, mm. in every walk of life for various mm. reasons. But I think we do have the unique, there are, there are uniquenesses to vets that make us more susceptible to it. And I think part of that would be our skills as actors. We mm. get very good at putting on an act Professionalism at the end of the day is an act. Mm. You know, I could cry with you putting your dog to sleep that I've treated for 10 years and be genuinely heartbroken and I have to walk out of that room down the corridor and say, hello, Mrs. Jones, how are we today? Now that's an act. Mm. And once you're living that act mm. every day in life, mm. you take it in, it spills, it can't not, it spills into other parts of your life. Mm. So when you really should be accessing help or you want to talk to somebody and you know, you're like, no, I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. Mm. And you feel fine for that minute when you say it because you're so used to doing that. Mm. So there's that point of the world, we all should be Hollywood A-listers and that's where the glamour should be because we're very accomplished actors, whether we want to admit it or not, we mm. are because we have to be. There's no two ways about it. To mm. be a professional in our profession, you must be a good actor. Mm. And yeah, I think it can spill into other corners of our life mm. that don't then let us ask for help when we need it. Because mm. we think we should be yeah. 
like this all the time. Mm -hmm. Your things should be fine all the time, even when they're really, really not. So, is do you think there's something about the trait, the character trait of people who become vets that think exactly how you say it because that is exactly what is happening like everything is all good 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 when it shouldn't be good but they don't ask for help so there's no cry for help do you think there's something about maybe you know they are like uh, i must get it right or else i'll be seen as incompetent uh, nobody ever complains if i start to uh, discuss about the harder parts of my job people may think that i'm a wimp or something like that do you think there's a degree of that well i think we hold ourselves to almost too high a taskmaster. Mm. But again, I don't, I don't necessarily think that that's a character trait rather than something that's trained into us. Mm. Again, because we have to. Mm. We, have to we have to fix this job. There's nobody else here to do it. I have mm. to. If mm. I fail, then mm. the job dies. So you have to hold yourself to a high enough... Mm. You know, it's... Um, I don't like saying it's a character trait. I do think it's trained into us. I mm. really do. Mm. So I wouldn't call myself any of those things before I became a vet. Yeah, yeah. and I, I agree. And I know exactly what I mean by the acting thing because one time, you know, what, what, one minute you are euthanizing, you are being sympathetic, giving out all the positive energy, saying, you know, I understand, especially like you say, you've seen the dog for 10 years, you know the owners for 10 years. And after that, when you go, then your next appointment is a puppy vaccine. So you have to go, congratulations, welcome again, you know, new, new puppy. And I, it's just giving a lot of positive energy at the end of the day. Uh, who is caring for the carer? Yeah, yeah. So, so I have to say, I did find that more and more difficult as time wore on mm. in, in practice. And it's one of the reasons that I left in the end was I became, I was so ill with depression. I didn't know I had depression. Mm. I was having um, hospital tests for a year to try and find out what was wrong with me. Mm. Um, I was having heart palpitations, night sweats, the whole nine yards. I had weak muscle weakness. Um, I was short of breath. And I really thought there was something really wrong with me, but nowhere in my brain. I'd had depression before, but it had never affected me physically. Yeah. Nowhere in my brain for a second did I think I had depression. And um, I actually had to leave. And, um, I just couldn't work anymore physically I couldn't it wasn't a mental thing at that point it was a physical thing and I changed doctors and they took one look at me and he went you're depressed I went what <laughs> no I'm not acting again and he was like yes you are and he started listing oh. off all this stuff and he said you didn't need any of these tests you should have come and seen me a year ago started an antidepressants and away I went but they where was I going with that oh yeah um the, the acting thing it was it was slowly starting to disappear right. and there were a few things a few times when i acted a little bit unprofessionally because i couldn't put that wall back up and walk in i remember putting to sleep five dogs um we had no space here at the kennels and they couldn't take them back to boarding kennels and i rang around all the other charities and they couldn't take them and i just put to sleep five dogs which would break your heart anyway never mind that one of them had a dog's trust collar on and I came back in and I had a consultation for a perfectly nice lady with her, I think it was a golden retriever, bitch puppy who was only six months old. And her daughter was there with her too. And her daughter was about 12. And she started asking me when the right time to breed this dog would be. Now bearing in mind that four out of five of those dogs I'd put to sleep with pedigree dogs. And I had just walked in from this um, and I just lost it. I didn't scream at her. But I gave her the dressing down of, of her life about breeding that bitch in front of her little girl. And I thought, oh, I was so sure I was going to get reported for that one. But at that point, I didn't care because nothing I said was a lie. It was all true. Mm. Um, and I said, you know, if you're willing to come back to me in two years' time and, and tell me that none of those pups that you bred were put to sleep, then fine, breed your dog. But I don't think you'll be able to do that. Uh, I don't know what, but it was this, this times, you know, and I think it was a result of my depression that that wall was starting to come down. The act was starting to slip. Mm. And it was a good time for me to get out. <laughs> wow. Oh, thanks for sharing that story, man. That is, that is hard. That is hard. So I, I'd like to sort of um, ask your opinion on this really. So is it, 
is being a vet. I mean, what you have experienced is pretty harsh, you know, working with a dog, sort of a dog pound, so to speak, and putting regularly putting contracted animals to sleep, so to speak, that, that is always hard. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, there are other people who have not gotten as tough a deal as yourself, but nonetheless, they're still getting depressed and things like that. So my question is that, is being a vet in evident, is inevitably going to lead to a high proportion of depression, or is there something else that we can? If if there was a magic, if you had a magic wand, and there's something that we can do to improve the statistics, to reduce depression, to enhance extending, to reduce attrition, dropout rates, and by default suicide, is there an answer? What do you think is the answer to this, or is this a profession that's definitely you think this profession? Your your, your working lifespan is X amount. You've got X percent chance of getting depressed, and there's nothing else you can do about it. Considering these are such long-standing statistics, well, what the- I'd say it comes down to kindness and support. I mean, even even amongst all of that that I had to go through, um, I didn't necessarily get the support from my employers that I should have had at times, and. At times there was no kindness from the general public you know when you're dealing with other things and at the same time you're under a constant fear of getting reported for doing something wrong or mm. saying something out of turn or and people don't realize how terrifying that is i mean to mm. them it's just a phone call or an email done i you know that woman really annoyed me so tickety 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 reported the rcbs never think about it again how dare they well they don't realize is that when we get that email or that letter, our blood runs cold because everything we have worked for our entire lives and dreamt of stands to be taken away from us. Mm. And it doesn't matter if you made up a collateral lies or whatever, and it's all blatantly lies, the RCBS have to follow that up. Mm. And it's letters and phone calls and phone calls to the BDS and terror. It's a sheer terror that you can never shift. I have a seven page dossier of lies made up that was thankfully the RCBS to send you copies of what of, you know what's been said so you can refute it. Seven pages of lies that this particular couple decided they would submit to the RCBS. Now, thankfully, the BDS were very, very good and sorted it all out for me. But it was a couple who, another charity at that time, who I had taken on bridge about the fact that they had decided they were going to no longer vaccinate any of their dogs. Now they were taking in pound dogs and I had been their vet for a while, years before, and was treating Parvo left, right and centre at the time. And the litters of, litters of puppies dying and all the rest of it. And they came out publicly and said they were no longer going to vaccinate because it was unnecessary and none of those going to vaccinate and all the rest of it. And I called them out on it. And because I called them out on that, they put my whole career in jeopardy. What they wanted to do was probably just give me a slap around the side of the head, but what they actually did was hit me with a hammer that you you don't get back up from that. Because every time you speak to somebody else or you do, it's always there in the back of your head. At any point, this could get taken away from me because of somebody lying. There's keyboard warriors, there's people who think it's fine to go on Twitter and Facebook and bury at a clinic because one person made a mistake and we're only human. You know, I think there's, there's that. That's one of the reasons I'm glad to be out of it, to be honest. I made a lot of friends amongst the public. I'm not going to say made any enemies, I probably did. But that fear now is gone. Okay. The fear that stood up in my whole career. This, this fear of the RCBS, and we shouldn't be frightened of them because they're, they're there to protect us as well. Mm. But it's that when you get something from the post and it's not annual re- renewal time and it has RCBS written on it, do you not kind of cross yourself before you open it? Mm. Like it's a horrible feeling. And people can do it over so little, you know, so little. Because, you know, you put a dog to sleep and he cried in the last five minutes, which does happen, unfortunately, that you were totally unprofessional and you didn't explain this or whatever, even if you did. They can report you for that. They can report you for whatever they want. Mm. And I think people have got to realise the consequences of that. This isn't, mm. I'm not just a mechanical figurine here. Mm. I'm a person who has a life and mm. feelings and it's literally pulling the rug out from under people's feet and it's, it's something that I find 
very distressing and I know a lot of my friends who've been in similar situations for less even than that who have had really really distressing times of it if you've well, left it you know that is, that is in career over that is yeah. just it's yeah, mad but, and, and, and kindness from colleagues too yeah. there can be a lot of um what's the word I'm not going to say rivalry because we're all in the same business and we're all trying to get the job done but unless I think it comes down to employer structure, unless an employer says this is the practice manager and this is what she says goes, you, you and you are all minions and you all listen to the practice manager. This is the way it should be done. Most of the places I worked, it was just free for all. I'm the boss and I'm not here. So the rest of us can sort it out. So if you had somebody acting blatantly unprofessionally, which I did have a few times and I called them out on it, then you got the sign of treatment for months. So I, I'm not going to go in. I'll tell you after what happened on one of those occasions. I'm going to say it on video because I like to think these people are completely ashamed of what they did. And I don't know. But this incident, let's just say, happened. And you know me, Lennon. I'm a very calm, nice person until you rattle my cage. And then it's like, bah! <laughs> so it's like, you know, yeah letting the lion out of the cage. Anyway, this incident happened. I completely blew my top, which I was in, I would do it again tomorrow. In fact, I'd probably go harder tomorrow. I'd probably have somebody up against the wall tomorrow. I completely blew my mind and screamed and shouted and get the hell out and it was. And what happened then was, I got a phone call from my boss who told me to come and see him and I got berated for telling them off. It wasn't my place to tell them off. I went, um, if I hadn't have told them off at that exact point, things, the outcome would have been very, very different. But th there's things like that. I mean, we just, mm. there's like a war almost amongst colleagues, mm. unless there's a really good structure coming mm. down from above. You really need that. There's, I mean, I've said a million times over, you need a boss who says, this is your job, this is your job, and this is your job. And if anybody has a problem, we'll go and talk to this one, and she sorts it out. You know, but so often in general practice, that's not the case. It's just, oh. I'm the boss and I'm not here and you guys can all just tear on. And it makes it so much more difficult. It's not a very it's personal good. experience, but no, it's no. Something, um, starting to sort life on hard. Yeah, just, I'll, 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 it's just an amazing story from both of you. Thank you very much for that. I'd just like to wrap this up with two different things. One is that if people want to find out more about Lucy's trust, or they want to make, they want to help, What's the best way to do so? How would they help and how would they find out more about Lucy's Trust? Um, well, you can find us on Facebook. Um, Lucy's Trust, all one word. And we do have a website, but we don't really because I haven't got around to actually <laughs> sort it out yet. It's run out of time. Well, I've got 38 dogs here on site. And that's a lot of work. I mean, I'm, I'm Zooming with you. You met Rob at the beginning. He's doing my work for an hour and a half so that I can do this with you. Um, yeah, yeah, what was it? Cool. I'll make sure you do the show notes. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're on Facebook. I think we're on Twitter and Instagram. I'm not really sure because I'm not very good. We'll do the Facebook. The second thing is that if you know, if somebody is interested to be a vet, now knowing what you know, what will your advice to them be? If you're interested in being a vet, it's probably not for you. If you feel that in your gut, this is what I'm going to do, then no matter about what I've said, it's for you. I mean, if you get the call, it's like going to do ministry or something. You know, if it's just something that you're thinking about, that might be nice, then don't do it. Just don't, because there's a lot of other jobs that would be a lot nicer. But if you're one of those kids that gets the call, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to. You're just going to have to. And I hope you have a better experience than I did. And I hope you will, because with people like Lennon, moving things forward, getting the dialogue open, hopefully the general public will be a little bit more respectful of you. And hopefully you won't have to be such a good an actor. You'll be able to ask for help. I would hope in the next five to 10 years, things will be very different for the guys coming out. That's, that's my biggest hope, that it's different, completely different to what my experience was. And probably yours too, Lennon. Just that the world has got a little bit kinder. I genuinely hope that. 
Thank you, Olivia. That is amazing, Lev. It's so good to see you again. And uh, I will certainly catch up with you soon. But so if you're interested in Lucy's Trust and supporting Lucy's Trust, look at the show notes. Support that is an amazing trust. I mean, it's good that Olivia is doing is, you know, just hands down really. And we need more people like that. And uh, I hope this has brought value to you. And I look forward to seeing the next live event.